And tell us again, so you were on which team and which Olympics? Tell us that. I am on the uh, U.S. Paralympic snowboard team. Mm -hmm. I've been on the team for seven years now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I went to the 2022 Beijing Games. Okay. And I won two world championship titles. I got over 20 World Cup medals to my name. And, and uh, SB. And an SB. Yeah. An SB. What was your SB winner for? as well? Best athlete with a disability. Awesome. Yeah. When, that was uh, that was cool. Well, yeah. Tell me what it was like to get the SB. Dude, that experience was crazy because I mean, like I've always thought of myself as an elite athlete, yeah. but then when I would think about some of the other, you know, like heavy hitters like LeBron James and Lionel Messi and stuff like that, like that to me was just like off in another realm. And then the ESPYs put me in the same room with all of them. Yeah. And I was just like, it was, oh, okay, yeah, this is, all right, this is like the circle that I'm in. Yeah. Um, and then when I won the SB2, that was crazy because the whole, the whole days leading up to, you know, every time I met an athlete that I knew, um, I just thought it was so cool that I had to run over and like talk to him, get a picture with him. And after I won, some of those athletes ended up coming up to me and they're like, congratulations on winning. Can we get a picture like together yeah. in our suits and everything? And so I was like, hey, look at it. Like yeah. a Vegas Golden Knight goaltenders asking for my photo. That's pretty cool, yeah. Right. Um, so you said you've been on the team for seven years. Are you still on the team? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just got named to the 2024 to 25 roster. Okay, cool. So, yeah, thank you. Congrats, yeah. that's awesome. Um, let me ask you this question, because people might just look at you and say, disability, What you look like a finely tuned, world-class athlete. What, mm. what disability do you live with, do you have? I get that a lot. Um, I do look able-bodied mm -hmm. um, and that's because uh, kind of the early start that I got. Um, so I was born with left hemiplegic cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a really wide range of severities and, and types of ways that cere cerebral palsy can affect you. Okay. Um, for me, the left side of my body is more affected than the right. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we caught it is because my grandma came out to visit me shortly after I was born and noticed that I wasn't acting like a normal baby. I wasn't able to hold my head up independently. Um, I seemed very tired all the time. And occasionally I would just kind of have these weird moments where I'd zone out and I wasn't responsive for a few seconds and then I would come back. Um, so they took me to an optometrist first because uh, one of the things they noticed was that I wasn't tracking anything with my eyes. You could shake some keys in front of me, but the second you moved them outside of my direct line of sight, I didn't care. Uh -huh. And so they took me there um, and he was like, he's not blind. I think it's a muscular issue. You should take him to Children's Hospital in uh -huh. Denver. So I went there and that was where they had a team of uh, cerebral palsy specialists watch me, uh, yeah. just watch me behave. and, and run me through a couple tests and then they, uh, they came back with the call. And so because I got the diagnosis at six months old and because it wasn't a very severe case to begin with, I started physical therapy just like that. I grew up in the hospital okay. um, doing lots of physical therapy and, uh, and even to this day, I still work very closely with my medical team, with PTs, with doctors yeah. um, to just keep my body in good shape because it's all about uh, prevention and maintenance, really. Okay. That's been my whole lifestyle. As much as I can stretch um, and loosen my body up to get ahead of the curve, as much as I can focus on recovery, then I can live a relatively normal life. Yeah. So it's still painful. There's still plenty of challenges. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm fortunate at the end of the day because if not for my disability, I never would have met a lot of the people that I did mm -hmm. in life. I wouldn't have gotten connected to some incredible people and I mm -hmm. wouldn't be traveling the world and representing the United States and snowboarding today. Absolutely. So how, if you know, just in like, you know, how do you describe your disability to people and, and, and specifically cerebral palsy and mm -hmm. muscle condition? Like how, how do you tell people? What, what do the you tell easiest people? way I describe it is think of someone who's a stroke survivor the kind of symptoms that they have. Uh, there's a loss of coordination, a loss of balance. Sometimes speaking is very difficult. And basically what cerebral palsy is, is I suffered a stroke during fetal development. So before I was born, I had the same effects of a stroke. Um, in my case, the umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck. And so I, I am kind of this, uh, this long-term stroke survivor. That's also a good reason why I, uh, I seem normal is because I've had my entire life to recover from it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, I appreciate that. So you're on this, you know, this snowboarding team. Um, you're going to the Olympics. You're winning world championships. <laughs> you're winning ESPYs. I mean, obviously, very, very accomplished. Thank you. Um, do you do you live here now in Salt Lake full time? 
Yeah, or I, I moved here to Salt Lake. To to train? Specifically for training. Okay. Yes. Uh, there's a facility up in Park City yep. that I was on my way to yep. on Friday um, where I train with a strength and conditioning coach and a, a whole bunch of professional athletes up there. Uh -huh. And those resources that they have, like that training facility, is it's world class. Yeah. I mean, it's second it's to none. Best. And yeah. so as soon as I had access to that starting last summer, I moved out here full time so I could be there as much as possible. So you've been here since last summer full time? Correct. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of what I wanted to get to. So you tell us again where you were going when this thing happened. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I can give I this mean, a it, second too, because he's also. Oh, okay. Should be quieting down in a second. No, we're Dude, fine. So yeah, we're fine. All right, so, okay. So like, you know, you're, you go out there probably all the time. Yeah. You're, I mean, are you out this there This was day? just a regular commute on okay. the bike. Um, yeah. Just another Friday, headed up to the gym for a, a pretty heavy workout so that I'd have the whole weekend to, to recover. And so I just had some music going on in my helmet and I was just, I was just vibing, you know, and um, I look off to my left and I'm passing this truck and I can see some kind of weird white smoke. And um, I'm a big fan of racing. Yeah. Uh, I love watching all different kinds of racing. And every once in a while you see kind of an engine failure where that same smoke comes out. And so when I saw that, that kind of piqued my interest because I was like, that could be anything, you know? And so as I got closer, I tried to kind of look under the truck to see if I could see what was going on. And then as, as soon as I kind of pulled up next to him, I could see the flames coming out of the engine bay. And I was like, okay, this is, a, this is an emergency situation. And that's when I, you know, start waving and trying to get his attention. Yeah, you just said emergency situation. When you see those flames for the first time, what ran through your, what ran through your mind? This could get pretty bad. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can say it <laughs> on the record, um, but just, oh crap, like this, this is a, a serious situation and we probably don't have a whole lot of time to fix this. So that's why I just started waving the way I did is I was really trying to get his attention. Obviously the faster he's going, the more air is just getting swept into that engine bay. Yep. And so the priority immediately just became like getting him to a stop and getting him out of the truck. Yeah. So I'm a car guy too. I'm seeing white smoke. I'm thinking he blew a head gasket, maybe a little bit of extra oil. Yeah. When you saw the flames though, you never see the flames. Man. You don't. Yeah. That's why it's like, it's, I, and like, what was it? A couple weeks ago, they, um, they had that, uh, there was a, a demolition derby that was out, um, past Park City. I can't remember like exactly mm -hmm. where it is, but like, yeah, I mean, not, not every day that you see flames coming out of an engine bay like that. So that's how I knew it was, that was not your, your regular like blown head gasket or whatever. This was a big problem. Yeah, so you, does, does he respond to you right away? Like, you know, we report on road rage all the time yeah. now. Like, <laughs> did, did, he, did he like pull over right away for you? That was my concern was just that, you know, I'm a motorcyclist um, and uh, you know, I'm on a speedy bike. Who knows if I'm alone? Who knows why I'm trying to get his attention? Yeah. Um, plenty of people have reached out since just saying like, I wouldn't have pulled over for you. I would have thought it, you know, you were trying to, to rob me or something. Right. Um, and, uh, and so I was just, I was worried that he wasn't gonna understand it was an emergency situation. And so I was doing my best to point at the engine bay mm -hmm. to, uh, I didn't know how to like signal that anything was on fire, but I just kept pointing at the front of his truck right. and then waving him off to the side of the road. And so luckily he, he responded pretty quick. I think the first few seconds, you know, it was just like, what in the yeah. world is that guy doing? And then yeah. once he saw me continuing to point, I think that's when he was like, okay, I need to get over and see, see what's going on. Um, you were on your way to train. You probably had a lot going on that day. Why did you stop? Why, why did you take that extra effort? And you know, some people probably wouldn't have. They would have just kept going on, been like, sorry, sorry, <laughs> yeah. dude, like, but like, I don't have time. I mean, like I said, you know, the, the truck was on fire. It's not really one of those things that you should probably just leave it be. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as much as I am trying to get up to the gym, you know, my, my coach is waiting on me or whatever, like this could potentially be a really dangerous situation. So it's really not taking that much out of my day to stop. Um, I wasn't thinking about any of that. As soon as I saw the flames, it was, I need to get this guy off the highway and we need to deal with the situation however we can. Yeah, and you can kind of hear it a little bit in the video, like he had no idea. Uh, no like clue, he, like, yeah. He, what, what was your take on that? He had to clarify like, several times. <laughs> Once we get to a stop, you know, I, I tried not to pull up directly next to his window. Um, I, you know, I tried to keep kind of a, just a safe distance. And uh, yeah, I just turned the music off in my helmet and was just yelling at him. I had earplugs in too, because I'm riding on the highway. And so I was just yelling like, dude, your truck is on fire. On fire? Yeah, you're on fire. Like literally on fire? <laughs> I mean, I don't blame him for, for second guessing um, and not understanding what was going on. Um, 
but yeah, I had to, I had to convince him and then I, I jumped off the bike and luckily he, he knew to get out of the truck. I ran over to the other side and then saw all the flames were still, still going on. And so that's when I waved him over and mm -hmm. asked if he had the fire extinguisher and, and then we just used whatever we had to, to deal with it. What did you have? What did you do? I mean, I know we can see from the video, but w what'd you do? Yeah, so the first thing I did, I asked if he had a fire extinguisher um, because I carry one in my car. Um, I feel like it's a, a good idea to have. There are a lot of small ones. Like I, I'm, I'd be willing to get it out and show it to you. They're pretty small, they're yeah. compact. Um, I got one at Walmart that was less than 30 bucks yeah. that's rated for car fires and electrical fires. Yeah. And so I was hoping with it kind of seeming like a work truck that he would have a fire extinguisher on board. When he said he didn't, that was when it started to get a little hairy because I mean, I have no idea how we're gonna fight this thing now. Um, so. My first thought was in my backpack, I had some Gatorade in a water bottle and I was like, okay, well, maybe I can start digging that out. And so he ran to the back of his truck and I took my backpack off and then that's when he just started scooping water bottles out at me. And so luckily I had some, some Kirkland water bottles. I grabbed that, I told him to, uh, to pop the hood, um, which normally you should not do yeah. if a car is on fire that feeds the, the yeah. fire with a lot of extra air but i mean this was a situation where we there was no way we could get to it if we didn't open the hood mm -hmm. so it quickly became just doing what this what the situation demanded um, a lot of what we did was not very safe the way we handled it we could have done some things better in hindsight yeah. but i mean i had seconds to think about this and so we opened the hood and and immediately just got in there with the water bottles and um Luckily, that was enough. I think the biggest factor was that we got to it quick. Yeah. Time was the, the thing that worked in our favor. Um, the fire was still growing at that point, but was small enough that the water could, could put it out and, uh, and douse the flames. And so as soon as we got in there and just started dumping water in, the, the fire you know, calmed down, it, flames went away. And, uh, and yeah, and then from there, it was just uh, making sure nothing else started up. Um, we kept monitoring it for you know, a minute or so. Um, and then I think that's when it kind of set in what had just happened because then the guy, you know, turns to me and he's like, my man, like, thank you so much. And so we embraced it on the side of the highway because I mean, who knows what would have happened um, right. if, if we hadn't stopped when we did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it definitely took some time for both of us to like really grasp right. what had just happened. And then that's when I realized like, oh, I have a GoPro on my helmet. I think I was recording the whole thing. And so I mentioned it to him. I was like, I think I got this whole thing on video. And he was like, that would be sick if you did. And so, uh, so then we just exchanged information and uh, I made sure he was okay. I made sure he had someone to call. He had a buddy with a truck that could come get him. Yep. Um, and then after that, I just told him like, hey, I, I gotta get to work. So yep. um, give him a fist bump. I had his number and uh, yeah, got back on the road. Have you talked to him since? I have, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I reached out, he ended up reaching out to me um, about an hour after I sent him the video and just said, bro, I think you saved my life today. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know if I did. Um, I know we definitely saved his truck. Uh, it's scary to think what would have happened had we not stopped. I think definitely it could have become worst case, you know, a situation that it involved and hurt a lot of people. Um, yeah. Because, you know, that's I-80 is a pretty big highway. There's lots of traffic. Yeah. Um, and if you have a, a truck suddenly, you know, go up in flames, like that, then uh, then who knows what it could have done. Um, but luckily it just turned into basically a, an inconvenience. And so then after that, I just kind of stayed in touch with him to make sure, you know, the truck made it to the mechanics. And um, yeah, I'm waiting to hear back exactly what went wrong. Because right. a lot of people seem to be interested on, on what caused that. Right. Um, but yeah, I definitely think we'll, uh, we'll probably stay in touch for a while. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're an Olympian. You're also a Paralympian. You're used to talking to people. Mm -hmm. You're a people person. Right? Yeah. You gotta be a people person. I mean, you gotta, yeah, you gotta be able to do you're, media. You're a car dude, you're a motorcycle dude. <laughs> you were paying attention. All these little things lined up that day that you were the one who was next to him, saw yeah. it, had the wherewithal to stop him and communicate it. How does that happen, man? Yeah, I mean, the stars aligned. Like you said, there were a lot of factors um, between me just kind of knowing what to look out for, um, paying attention to his truck, stopping him the way I did, him stopping for me. I mean, there's, it was kind of a perfect storm that resulted in it, I think, working out so well. If any one of those different factors hadn't yeah. been there, then it could have been a completely different situation. So it's also, I don't know if it's really even hit me, um, yeah. <laughs> just how, uh, 
how crazy it is that it worked out so well. Um, but you know, I think it's just the fact that we we reacted quick. I think it's the fact that um, he saw I was trying to help that. He listened and pulled over quick, and that you know neither of us really hesitated when it got down to, to dealing with the fire and keeping everything safe. So, yeah, I mean it's it's pretty fortunate the way it worked out. What I, did that uh, what did that fist bump and that hug mean to you, dude? I, I mean it's when he came and just kind of gave me the hug. Um, you know, I, I was just laughing because um, it's just bonkers that it it worked out so well um, and that yeah I mean it was it was dawning on us that that was a tremendously dangerous situation and I mean how lucky that we had enough water on hand to deal with it um, and all that stuff so when he finally just you know had it sink in and turned to me and was like my man and we just <laughs> we just hugged it was it was just two human beings you know that had just gone through a crazy experience out of nowhere together and uh, we're just happy that everyone was okay so you've got a million something views on that <laughs> slightly less we'll have slightly less on ours tonight <laughs> yeah. sorry to say um but people who do see this man what do you want to say to them what should they do Ooh. what should they take away from all of this whole thing yeah i got a i got a little psa prepared because <laughs> i definitely and of course there's a skateboard in the trunk <laughs> yes there's a skateboard in the back um but what's so. the takeaway man i know it sounds kind of silly to be like there's, a takeaway from all this, but there's definitely a takeaway um and i would love to love to mention that um should i still say it to you or just go yeah, you can say it to him. all right yeah. fair enough i mean to anyone that's watching at home i think the most important thing is that whatever you're driving it's important that your rig is prepared for emergency situations um, that situation is actually a, a somewhat common emergency on the roads um, so the chances that you you encounter something like that are high you could be next it's important in that case that you have the right tools on hand to deal with that emergency safely and effectively right here this is just a small fire extinguisher that I got at Walmart for less than 30 bucks. It's BNC rated, so it can deal with uh, flammable liquids, it can deal with electrical fires, and it just stores in a small compartment in my car. It's safe if I leave my car parked outside, um, it's safe to deal with those temperatures. And had we had something like this, we could have dealt with that situation much more safely. Um, you wouldn't so have been going to plan B. With, I wouldn't have been with the Costco water bottles. Scraping up Costco water bottles okay. and, and risking being injured yeah. by by throwing my hand into his in, into his engine bay. You yeah. know, if yeah. if either of us had had something like that on hand, yeah. that would have been dealt with uh, much better. Yeah. Um, and obviously, if the situation was worse, then we would have still had something that mm -hmm. could have handled it. Yeah. A couple other thoughts that I had. I'm listening to your story, like even from when you were born you know, all the way to now at this point of your life, you seem to be really good at early detection and finding things early <laughs> and like having it be the best of a bad situation. Yeah. Like, do you think about that? You like seem to, the early detection's kind of your thing. That is a good parallel. <laughs> um, early detection has played a very critical role in my life. Yeah, from, and you helped this guy in his life. Yeah, from it. the early detection of my, my disability and starting treatment right away mm -hmm. to the early detection of snowboarding and getting involved in sports so young as a kid. Yeah. That also turned me into the elite athlete that I am today. And then yeah. early detection and just you know being vigilant and being willing to help a fellow human was the reason why that guy stayed safe and we were able to save his truck that day yeah are you surprised with this thing just going absolutely bonkers online like it's it's a crazy video don't get me wrong yeah. like it's 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 insane to watch but like what's your thought on how insane it's gone online i did not expect it to go as viral as it did yeah um I've been trying to, to grow my social media um, and, and earn some, some extra followers for years now. Uh, the more followers you have, the more enticing you are for, for businesses and companies that might want to sponsor me for my snowboarding. And so I've been, I've been working on it for years and I was getting real close to 3,000 followers. I was like 10 or 15 followers away and then when this happened I was like, man, I got to trim this down and post it quick. And maybe it'll just help me get those last like 10 or 15 that I need to break 3,000. And then and I'll make a little appreciation video about it. And so I, I was cropping up the video and, um, and my mom kept pestering me. She's like, will you get off your phone and just come eat dinner with family? And I'm like, yeah, just give me a second. Like, I just want to get this video up. And she's like, you can do it later. And I was like, I know I can do it later. I just, I mean, I'm almost done. Like, 
yeah, this video probably isn't, ah, whatever. And so I just like finished cropping it. I put the extra little things in and then I, I chucked it up on Instagram and I went to eat dinner with my family. And um, yeah, and then cut to, what is it? Five days later, it's got over 20 million views. Yeah. I have over 15,000 followers. Yeah. Um, I've had people from all different countries and cultures reach out and yeah. just say like, thanks for, thanks for keeping an eye out. And um, this is amazing and incredible video. I've had so many companies coming up to me asking me to repost it. And it's just, I definitely did not expect it to gain as much traction, but I think the reason why it has is because, you know, people need to see some good news every once in a while. And, you know, my video is one of a human being looking out for a fellow human being and and dealing with a situation that was that was scary and dangerous, but doing it quickly and it resulted in a happy ending. So I think it it's the perfect video and uh, I'm uh, I'm pretty glad that it's uh, <laughs> it's just it's led to some it's led to some crazy things and I think it'll open up a lot of opportunities for me moving forward. 